Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're uh, Zooming in from Asia. Uh, I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford, and we're very happy to produce this uh, series of seminars, weekly seminars on the overall theme, the emerging digital economy in context, US Asia cooperation and competition. So in this series, we're looking at several key industries that are starting to do things in a new way, thanks to the digital tools that we have available. Uh, besides today on venture capital industry, in a couple of weeks, we have a presentation about influencer marketing. Hopefully we'll have a presentation on uh, new tools for supply chain management. And as you remember from last week, we had a presentation about AI governance and the kind of government industry relations that went into co-creating a framework in Singapore for that. So if you're taking the course for credit, today is the deadline for your comments from the September 26th session. Send in one comment a week about that week and send it in within two weeks of the session date. And um, I look forward to reading them. I'm always behind, but I've gotten about halfway through them. And so uh, hopefully uh, we can all get back in, in more real time. Uh, I want to thank our member companies for their support of the US Asia Center uh, because it's really thanks to their membership fees that we can put on programs like this and benefit the public as well as do knowledge exchange with our member companies. So uh, today, I'm especially happy and excited to welcome Ms. Madhu Shalini Iyer uh, back to our seminars. Madhu has spoken for us before. Uh, she is currently managing partner with Rocketship.vc, which is a venture capital firm. Uh, before joining Rocketship, she was the chief data officer for Gojek which you may know is a very large now super app, started out as a ride hailing service from Indonesia. Uh, she opened their Singapore office. She was a board member of Gojek and she helped grow the company into a $10 billion decacorn. Uh, she was also before that part of the founding team of QuickBooks at Intuit and grew that platform to $300 million in value. And she holds several patents from her time with Intuit. She's also been the chief data officer of a company called Ethos Lending. And she's been a partner in a Hong Kong based private equity firm. And she started out her career as a senior data scientist at a nameless think tank in Menlo Park, which I have a feeling we could all guess within two tries. Uh, so Madhu, thanks very much for uh, joining us today. Um, how did you, what made you interested in becoming a venture capitalist? Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for having me and it's great to be here today. Um, you know, I, um, I've, uh, I am an accidental venture capitalist. Um, I um, have, uh, you know, I love uh, data. I've always loved data uh, since I was a child. Uh, math, really. Um, and, um, you know, I, um, I, I just decided uh, that, you know, I wanted to kind of do something with data very early on. Um, and as I, um, you know, as I kind of, uh, uh, it kind of came into my first job, which was very, very heavy data science, even before the word was coined. Uh, what I realized and understood is that I love building, uh, you know, I love building things mm -hmm. uh, and, and building products. And I was very, very uniquely um, lucky to have been in the Valley before the word data science was coined, working in a statistics and data science practice. Um, and where I decided, you know, uh, that I really love um, working on, uh, building uh, products and helping companies think through products uh, and how they want to kind of you know change the world, um, and and from there uh, I think it just you know it snowballed into um, into getting into startups uh, uh, and you've just kind of you know uh, laid out my journey 
um, but you know, it's um, it really it was at Intuit QuickBooks Financing. Just to um, you know, it's a, sm a small correction. QuickBooks, of course, predates me, but QuickBooks Financing, which is when FinTech 101 happened and lending just started, and you know, there there was like on deck and lending club and just many many, and then Cabbage kind of incorporated their office and had come into QuickBooks uh, financing office. Okay. Uh, so lots of things, uh, and I just decided that startups and building products is where data is most useful. Uh, and that's what, that was my savant skill to enjoy that. Uh, okay. And, you know, as a result, I had done lots of startups. And what I then wanted to do was I wanted to kind of be across the board, not just living in, because when you build a startup or you're part of a startup, you have to live and breathe that problem day in and day out for years. And it's, uh, you know, it is, something that you have to be truly passionate about. What I, what I understood later as I kind of progressed in life in terms of having built some things is that I really wanted to be uh, seeing many more things at once and that mm -hmm. you can't do while you're building one product right. or one company. So, I, you know, it really, um, it really was that I had to kind of go out and start looking at, uh, you know, various opportunities and venture capital um, again was an accident because as I was at Intuit and I'd got a couple of patents, uh, folks in Hong Kong and Southeast Asia reached out to me. Um, I had gone to high school in Singapore uh, and to university in Australia. And so, and then I'd spent, you know, over a decade here in the Valley. Uh, it was uh, therefore not completely accidental that somebody from Southeast Asia called me because I'd still kept in touch. Um, and uh, so I went back. Uh, and and the person who had actually invested in that particular startup that I was you know doing a lot of consulting with wanted me to join as a partner. And you know I I wasn't sure whether I could really kind of become a partner at a yeah. venture capital fund. But uh, that's when I truly realized uh, how much how much fun I had doing that, which is to sort of see many startups at the same time uh, to help them to uh, you know to do due diligence on them to meet founders and, you know, other first employees. Folks think that founders are the most important thing. I think the first employees uh, and the people surrounding the founders, you know, during those initial days is equally fascinating, uh, you know, and great folks to work with, work for, uh, work around. So that's how it all started, you know, and, and then since then, you know, I've just kind of uh, uh, gone from, uh, you know, gone from being just a startup operator to, I guess, a, uh, uh, you know, a venture capitalist. Okay. So we have one slide about uh, rocket ship. Uh, if you would, uh, while we've got the slide being shown, it's a little bit bright back there. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about rocket ship. Absolutely. Um, so rocket ship is a, um, so I joined rocket ship in 2019 uh, after my time at Gojek and ethos lending and being a senior data scientist at exponent in Menlo park and at Intuit. So quite a few stints uh, being an operator. Uh, and then of course my private equity uh, uh, stint. Um, I joined Rocketship, um, believe it or not, it was uh, again an accident. I had, I'd actually started raising my own fund. Uh, and you know, just a little quick pre-story before I get to Rocketship. Uh, I'd started my own fund and I'd raised about, you know, I'd, I'd raised about $17 million and uh, I'd not called in the capital yet. But I'd started doing due diligence, uh, you know, you know uh, with a few startups, and I met the uh, I met the um, the founding partners of Rocket Ship, uh, Salesh, Anand, and Venki, uh, while I was doing due diligence on a deal that I was seeing in LATAM and in Southeast Asia. Um, it fascinated me a lot. We got to know each other. Um, Rocket Ship is an early stage investment fund based in the Valley, and in 2017, I can tell you. There was nobody here in the Valley looking globally across the world. Rocket ship was one anomaly. And I was just fascinated with these guys saying, how did you know about these, you know, about this startup in Southeast Asia or in LATAM? Uh, and turned out that they were using a data-driven model to find the best startups across the world. Uh, it didn't matter where you are. And it's truly the, the one seamless way of doing, um, you know, of doing investing. It's a new sort of investing style. Uh, and I was fascinated from the from the get go, um, and so I joined it's very them. Very different from what most venture capital firms do. Absolutely. I mean, once you become Andreessen Horowitz, people come to you, and maybe they don't have to go out and look so much. But 
uh, I think deal sourcing is one of the biggest headaches for a, you know, a mid-sized venture capital firm. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, just to very quickly go back, it's a, it's not a small fund in the sense that it is small, you know, when you compare, when you compare it with an Andreessen Horowitz, but it's almost 300 million in AUM across three funds. It's actively investing out of its third fund. Now we are, uh, it's a seed to series B. So, you know, across stages. Um, and the big thing is that it's both sector agnostic uh, and it's also geography agnostic. So it's in 14 different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you cannot do, to your point, deal sourcing in 14 different countries cannot be done. You have to have a presence in, in every country. We are, we are completely valley-based. All of the folks that work for us are in the valley. We're in Los Altos. If anybody wants to check us out, rocketship.vc. Uh, we are looking for, for founders and for you know, other partners to work with all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, so, and so deal sourcing, to your point, it's, it's really very, very inbound today. So today, the way that, you know, folks, and we do it outbound first, we always, we have our database and our algorithms, and we, and we kind of talk to companies all across the board. Um, the way that VCs originally, uh, you know, and it's still done today, uh, look, people can just walk into the street and find something they love and they want to go and invest in it. So that's obviously, you know, that's always an obvious, but the typical common base of doing it is like one, maybe they have like folks reaching out to them. So a lot of people want to raise a lot of founders, you know, uh, you know, people who want to start companies, reach out to VCs wanting to pitch their ideas uh, and, and get money. So there's a lot of need for capital. The second way that VCs do this is that they have their own scouts, their principals and their associates, uh, you know, they themselves, they have scouts in universities and accelerators and, you know, in, in different pockets and, you know, they go to conferences and all of these scouts bring in the best companies. And the other way is they become thesis focused because you can't do everything. You know, if you look at our fund, it seems like we are boiling the ocean, but we are not because, you know, we've got a very directed way of going to these startups and finding the best of them. But a thesis driven fund yeah. makes it just a lot more contained. So you're just doing FinTech, you're doing early stage FinTech. You would live and breathe those problems. What are the problems that folks are facing right now? What can be started? So they're going really early or even late, but it's just one focus and they become subject matter experts sometimes in that focus, you know. And not to say that they become subject matter experts and we are not, but it's just that they, they have to live and breathe just that one problem because you know that's the only way of finding the deals. And so that's and, the way of- Think about it. Also the availability of the data tools to help provide the information that you need. If you don't have really active use of that, then you're limited to what you can look up. Absolutely, right? and absolutely. And one thing that doesn't scale is 24 hours in a day. So yep. this kind of quant-driven investing approach, actually, there have been a lot of public market investment funds that would claim to be doing this. And a lot of, quote, technical investors in public markets for years, right? I mean, to the point where it's almost like the algorithm does the whole process. Absolutely. Um, why is that? so slow and happening in VC? I think that's a great question. Um, if you look at um, quantitative investing for public markets, you know, it's the data is available. You know what is the company's revenue, its internal metrics, you know, how they are doing. Uh, you have all the financial metrics of company for a public company. And so, um, you know, uh, there are two really big examples of hedge funds that started in New York that were heavy duty quant focused. Uh, those hedge funds are uh, Renaissance Technology, Rentec, uh, and uh, uh, Two Sigma. These guys started quant investing in the 1980s, 1990s, wow. I would say. Uh, and they were very, very quant heavy. Uh, and, and, and it's public markets because they, can, they know what's going on inside a company and they're able to sort of predict to an accuracy that's much above everybody else around them. Because uh, everybody else was, you know, doing the old fashioned reports and, you know, analysts sort of like looking through things and typing in stuff and getting to a thesis. These guys used it and like they're 
Yeah, so I'm seeing a picture of a lot of publicly available data. So everybody has the same data. And if you've got better tools than the other people have, then you can rely more on your that's right. quantitative an analysis. Exactly. And so that was, that's been done really well for, uh, for public companies and in that stage in the hedge fund. Now, moving over to VC and private markets, we are dealing with very early stage companies, companies that don't have any of their internal data available to anybody. Uh, these are companies, and so that's why, you know, the, the problem really is, is the lack of availability of the data. So, so if you look at it, you know, historically, for the longest time, the process of quant in investing, you know, in venture markets was not possible because of the lack of data. But what happened um, in, um, you know, it's, it's really only what the VC, data that the VCs had, right? Um, so the initial set of quant investing was based on like folks that had invested for a long time mm -hmm. and knew, you know, who else was investing in what. So it's like, the, it was just based on two things, honestly. It was just the founder quality. Mm -hmm. They knew that. And they knew the partner from another fund that had invested in a startup and how successful that startup became. There was a, there was a fund called Correlation Ventures that just yeah. did this. They basically looked at the founder quality and looked at other partners from different funds that had invested in a particular company. So if, if a famous VC had invested in this company and, or maybe not famous, but if a VC a who had VC. an incredibly exactly. great track record for growing exactly. companies had yeah. invested. They would invest. And that was, and okay. you know, to their credit, that was the only data that was available. What happened in the early 2000s was that the social media properties really came on to the internet. Because you, know, you have, if you want to hire, if you want to attract customers, if you want to do any kind of business for Facebook, for Twitter, you, you know, um, with Facebook and Twitter also coming on, like anything that you had to do in terms of hiring, brand, brand building, acquiring customers, you had to go on to the internet. So once you went on to the internet, there was a lot of data that got produced as a result of this. And so, um, you know, by the by 2010s, you know, this was this data was prevalent. Uh, and you know, and there's a reason we started in 2014, 2015. That was our first first fund. If we had started in 2000s, you know, we would have been we would have also been flying blind because you just didn't have the data. So it was yeah. we were at the right place at the right time to very, very early on realize that there was so much of data coming online because of the internet. And, uh, and it's actually- not only You also mentioned social media. Um, how do you get through the possibility of fake information and so forth from, you know, I'm not sure I would trust Twitter for, uh, or X formerly known as Twitter uh, for information on a possible investment. You know, it's all directional. Um, because when you have vast amounts of data, uh, there are it's very easy to do anomaly detection. And so okay. there's lots of different ways of sort of like uniformly, you know, uniformity, I would say. You know, yeah. you can sort of, it's, it's just like fraud detection. Yeah. But you need to have that massive, if there's like 10, you know, it's just on the quantum of the data that you're looking at. If it's, you know, tens of hundreds of things, you know, of just data points, you have to be careful because any decision you make on that, you know, the probability of something going wrong is higher. But if you have like millions of data, which is what we are seeing, um, you know, the the probability of the fraud detection goes, you know, the 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 probability of the uh, of the correctness of the fraud detection just gets better and higher, which is okay. what we've seen. Okay. Um, and so we've uh, so we've really been able to take. So going back to the previous point, you have all of the social media pro property coming on, not just social media property, but just presence of like companies because they are doing business online. You know, like I said, hiring online and cu acquiring customers online. So they had to have user ratings. You know, they had just a lot of other metrics that were becoming uh, available. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, the uh, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that by the time we started, there was so much of data that was available uh, that we, enough amount of data that was available that we can directionally sort of like, we right now we have 50 million companies in our database. That, that's like, you know, the, the quantum of that is we have half a petabyte of data in our systems right now. And so when you have that many companies, we are trying to do our deal sourcing directionally 
based on that. So we have about 1,200 companies or so per year that we reach out to. So about 120 per month. Uh, okay. And and the thing is, nobody believes us. So when you have a LinkedIn reach out or an email from us, people are like, what are you doing? You know, you are a VC. We are supposed to be coming yeah, to we, you. We should you be know? finding you. We should be finding you. Like, how come you guys are finding us? And we just have that amount of certainty that there is something really great happening with that company. Yeah. And so, you know, and so that's how the outbound so You're looking is. for particular kind of signals in exactly. this huge amount of data that's that would exactly right. indicate a very interesting investment. Absolutely. And I think it's okay. really, you know. And you can do this all the way down to seed level. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed that you're seed to early stage. And I think the earlier you go, obviously, no, the noisier the directionality becomes. Yeah, um, yeah. But we have seen over the years, because we've been doing this for seven, eight years now, uh, actually longer than that, almost a decade, uh, my partners have. Um, and By directionality, do you basically mean going up in value, increasing in size, or what, what do you mean by directionality? I think that's a great question, and I'm sorry, I, didn't, I wasn't clear. What I mean is that, you know, the, in VC, the more number of companies that you speak to, uh-huh. Yeah. The be, you know, the better your odds of, you know, betting becomes like, you know, right. you have to speak to a lot of companies in order yeah. to pick 10 or 15. Yeah. Um, the directionality is the, uh, what I mean by directionality is that the, um, the quality of a company, the measure of a quality of a company. So directionally, we know this is a good company. Yeah. Uh, it, well, is it a good company? Is it a great company? Is it the best company? You know, yeah. That is just minor tweaks, mm -hmm. but we get most of the way that this is a great company with, okay. with our algorithm. So the directionality okay. is the measure of, a, of the quality of a company. So you cannot speak to 50 million companies, but you can sort of slowly, you know, tweet it down to say, whittle it down to say 1,200 companies. But 100 companies a month. How many partners? That's the beauty of it again. <laughs> you know, like we, uh, it, with just the way our team is formed, you cannot speak to, you know, you cannot, first of all, you can't speak to 50 million companies. No. Nobody can. I don't think even an Andreessen Horowitz can handle that uh, in so many geographies. Mm -hmm. 1,200 companies, again, a little bit difficult, uh, but 120 companies per month, we have a team of, so, uh, of you know, senior associates. Okay. Uh, you okay. know, and so, yeah. and so 120 companies is actually a really reasonable amount, but uh, okay. I guess the, the important thing here is that our algorithms take into account whatever is going on around the world uh, in terms of the number of companies. External events. And external events. Okay. External, okay. microeconomically. Not, mm -hmm. We don't do many macros today, like currency okay. risk and all of that. Those are some things that we don't do, but microeconomically, you know, things okay. that okay. matter, we, we see all that. This infrastructure is growing. You know, this is okay. a hot topic among consumers. That Absolutely. kind of thing. Absolutely. Okay. You know, and I think the two different kinds of, you know, and I'm, of course, uh, you know, I am, uh, I, I tend to be a geek. So please like hold me back if I go too much into it. But if I, um, there are two kinds of, uh, you know, things that you see in the data. One is observational data, which is what I spoke about. There's the social media presence. There's the, there's the externalities, as you, as you said, you know, what's going on? Are people liking this product a lot? You know, is there a lot of like Twitter mentions and whatnot? And then there is the, um, there is the observational data, which is basically how do you measure the quality of a company in its neighborhood? You know, what are other companies like this in this field in fintech? For example, alternative lending. How many companies are there in our database? You know, how are each of them performing? So it's kind of like, you know, some sort of an observation that we can make about a particular company uh, with respect and comparing it to other companies in its category. Of course, there are some category leaders and category defining companies, and these are all outliers, and we have different ways of sort of dealing with most of these. So that means that, you know, a key part of your competitiveness is the quality of your whole algorithms and approach to investing that way. Um, that, I guess, is completely trade secret or how, how do you handle this? So, you know, we've actually, um, it is something that we are, obviously that's the way we do our business. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it is a little bit of a secret, you know, we don't want to expose our models to everybody and we don't know, it's not an API sure. that we share with others. Uh, it's our moat, it's our differentiation. 
Um, and, um, you know, I, I would say that, um, I would say that the quality we've, we've been at it for a decade, yeah. our data has improved, our data procurement has improved, we now get different kinds of data, there's credit card data, there's just a gamut of data that you can credit get. Credit card data. It's just all yeah. kinds of data that's available. You know, I think what has happened with so many, so right now what's happening is that there are more and more, uh, this is the way forward. I truly believe that you cannot be, you know, having like the same kind of deal sourcing that you had years ago. Even very traditional VCs have started trying, uh, you know, this kind of data-driven investing. Uh, and they have their own like programs within their orgs to be doing yeah, data yeah. Uh, investing. And so what has happened with all of these guys coming in is the amount of data that's available and people wanting to make that av uh, available, like credit cards, for example, it's yeah. just exploded. So you can get so much more data than you could ever get before that it's it's fascinating. And and it's, you know, it's, a, it's almost like a difficult thing for us to keep up with as well. So anyway, so we have the data, we have the algorithms uh, and that, and it has, it's actually really just kind of, improved over the years, the algorithms. We have so many different versions of the algorithms and you know, we are on the, I think the 10th or the 11th version of our algorithms. You know? uh, and so anyway, long story short, we really have um, also spoken to so many companies over the years and we have internal data and all of that is a black box and, uh, and we keep- and we keep, So you keep those records, but of course that's never shared. And right. that's never right. shared. Okay. You know, it's a black box, we don't, and it's never going to ever be Right. Uh, publicly available sure. it's it's our moat uh if we are in the uh, we but are even in the just having that kind of institutional memory in a way that it can be searched or accessed is really valuable that is exactly right yeah. it is an institutional memory it is a trade secret therefore so you source let's say 1200 companies a year or even a few more in multiple different countries then uh that's the upfront deal sourcing then you have to do due diligence um does it start to look more like traditional vc from that point you meet with the um, founders of the company in person and what happens after you've sourced the deals absolutely i think that's a great question so uh, the reason i kept saying directionally is that it can you can never in venture capital investing in private markets get all the way this is not like a public market where we can make the decision and invest right at the, you know, at the press of a button, we can never do that because we just don't know the internal metrics of a company. Uh, and so it gets us directionally, the, it whittles it down. And then the last mile is completely, you know, it's, it's just traditional VC-like. Okay. We have to meet with the founders. We have to understand the internal metrics. Uh, you know, we have to sort of, uh, you know, just do the last mile is always more traditional mm -hmm. VC. And I think, I think that's, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, but the thing is that, out of the 1,200 or so companies that we are reaching out to, there's seldom been any time in the last at least five years that I've been uh, with Rocketship where I've picked up the phone or gone on Zoom and said, you know, what was that? I've never had to say that because directionally, I'm already interested in the company. It's an interesting company. It's got, you know, it's got a great story. It's got a great, you know, metrics. And so, so that's, I think, you know, a really important, so it gets us a long way. And the last mile is more VC-like, mm -hmm. but getting to that place is actually the secret sauce, you know. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And what you know, bringing into the meeting when you meet with the That's founders. exactly right. And what you know. Yeah, bringing yeah, into the yeah. Really so um, COVID, you know, made everybody have to work from home and, and Zoom was it for everybody. That must have been very interesting in the venture capital industry where a lot of it was in person even your last mile, right? Absolutely. So how did COVID affect what um, happened at, at your firm, at Rocketship, and also kind of generally in the industry? Absolutely. I think it is uh, it is uh, very important to note that because of the way we invested, since 2014, we have been investing even in the last mile via Zoom or whatever technology was so available back then. You don't have to meet in person. You can deal with this completely remote. We have, uh, we don't, uh, you know, I've met a lot of VCs that have told me that they need to look into the eyes of a founder before they invest. Uh, we have looked into a lot of eyes through Zoom <laughs> and through technology, you know, in, interfaces. And um, we feel very confident uh, in, uh, in most of the investments that we've made since our fund won. 
uh, and uh, we've always done this uh, done this online. Uh, of course, we've met our founders and we like to meet. So it's not because you know we are um, that we are you know not social. Uh, we we like to meet people, but it's you know it's not like a, it's not a mandatory requirement for us. So so there's a lot of things that happened uh, for us very early on with this kind of an approach where it was not necessary for us to sort of go and meet the founder and, you know, and look into their eyes and, mm -hmm. and, and see, because we, we knew from seeing so many companies that the top percentage that we saw from our algorithms was already a certain quality of a company, was already a certain, you know, and, and there are lots of metrics that measure the quality. Yeah. And the other thing, I'll, you know, there is some metrics that everybody knows. It's the founder quality. It's the way the company is doing. It's in the category of the company that you're creating. It could be a category defining company. It could be in the other investors. But we are very proud to say internally and externally that we don't get influenced by who the other investors are around well, the table. You take a, the lead investor position sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes we do. And sometimes we follow. Uh, but that's mostly only because of our capital, you okay. know, and the way and the way we are investing. Yeah, right. It's a three million dollar check per company usually. Yeah. But you know, it's important to note that we are not very influenced by who's around the table. Uh, okay. And, okay. Uh, and so you know, it's it's it is it it does get us quite a long way. Uh, and and when we came to 2020, it was fascinating for us to be receiving calls from a lot of our colleagues in the VC world. To say, you know, how are you? Because it was very new to them. How do we do this? How do we do this? And so we, it was just more of the same for us. And we had done this for years. Okay. Okay. So you didn't see anything like a shift more toward the later stage because of having more information on companies as they grow, right? I mean, you do have more information on the later stage companies, but you've stayed at the early stage. You know, and I think that's, um, and that's a really interesting question. Um, we have, we do have more data available as you know the stage increases because it's just you know it's just it's more it's more history yeah. of the company you know there's just more paper trail all over you know data trail uh, if you if you will um, but we've uh, we've stayed really focused on early stage because a uh, we really think that that's where the bang for the buck is uh, b we also feel that you know for the later stage as later you go there are not too many companies in, for example, a B2B company. There are not too many series C and D companies. It whittles down. And so the world of sourcing for most other VCs has whittled down to only a few companies. And so our competitive advantage is not as much when you're doing much later stage. Can we do a great job? And can we, can we get like the 10 out of the top 150? Sure. I have, you know, I know that we can because I've seen it. Of course, your IRR is not nearly as big as if you invest early. And that's why, you know, it's just the, uh, it, it really is the best for us to be investing in the stages that we are and, you know, go a little bit later as well. And we still be able to do really well. But, you know, we, we have loved investing in early stages. So this seems like a really disruptive kind of phenomenon for the venture capital industry. Are other VCs really starting to take a more data-driven approach? What, what's happening kind of industry-wide? Absolutely. There are lots of, um, you know, there, there is uh, there's signal fire. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of guys that are doing this now. Uh -huh. um, and uh, they, but everybody is doing it in different ways. Uh, but the one thing that I will just say is that the future of venture capital is going to be data-driven. Uh, it is not going to be possible for even somebody like an A16Z, uh, you know, an uh, A16Z to be just sitting here or having an office in China or an office in, uh, you know, Latin America, because trends are shifting constant. Uh, things are happening around the world. Uh, one of the slides that I should have had and I don't is that in 2017-18, the most amount of unicorns were in the valley. Uh, things have shifted. Now there's just many, many more places in the world that you are India going to, has uh, spawned quite a few unicorns in the last few years. They have, and it's you know a hundred unicorns, um, and it's not just India, but you know places like Southeast Asia, Dubai. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just so many great places where uh, you know there's a lot of activity, uh, startup activity, mm -hmm. and so you know uh, the, the question uh, to be begged is, you know, is it is it just a is it just a valley play or a US play? I would even say that people don't even in, invest outside the valley. 
Uh, there are lots of people that I know who only invest in the valley and not even outside. So, okay. Still, yeah, still. Okay. And so, you know, I, I really do think that it's it, it's going to become more of the norm. People use it differently. For example, uh, and I won't name names of funds uh, because, you know, I, sure, I, no, I, I cannot represent them. Yeah. But some uh, funds use data to do due diligence. And, you know, they will, uh, they, but they are not using it for deal sourcing. They're using it for due diligence. There are very few funds that I have found personally uh, that use it for due deal, uh, that for use it for deal sourcing the way we are. Uh-huh. And so uh-huh. there are different ways of using it, but I do think that data driven is going to just become more of a norm than the anomaly. Okay. Um, so in that sense, you still have the potential for being the disruptor. What's going to disrupt? what you're doing do you think gen ai is going to put all the vcs out of a job absolutely i think uh, that's a great question uh, gen ai is going to be helping vcs become even better uh, at you know i think it's going to really make the you don't need to have you know we have built for a decade these algor uh, this algorithms and you know yeah. and this this entire sort of class of like algorithms which predict this that and the other um, it is going to make the disruption cycle faster for other VCs, uh, which is, you know, which is a, you know, and I have opinions, obviously, as rocket ship on why this might be difficult for them and not. But I will just say that for Gen AI, for other VCs now, searching, querying, yeah. you know, using foundational models to sort of say, um, hey, how do I, you know, like, what is the best company out there? You know, how do I kind of make sense of this data? It's just going to sort of expand and like expedite all of that for them. But we also could also see them using it from their board seats and saying, you know, show me a simulation of what will happen to this company if they do what I tell them to do, you know, or if they don't do what I tell them to do. You know, and the thing is that, and there's there's so many interesting ways that it can be used, and these are like you know much of course more future steps. We ourselves use Gen AI. Uh, okay. Some of the ways that we use Gen AI is that. Um, you know, the problem of, uh, so I say Gen AI and then I, I have our own moat. The biggest and the most complex problem of doing this kind of a strategy is that you are getting data from multiple sources right. on the same company. Right. You know, you, can, you could be company X and, and PitchBook might say something about you, you know, XYZ. There's like 25 different data sources yeah. giving a point of view about company X. The real nuanced problem, you know, the, the problem of unifying and making one row for a company, that's the truth, as close to the truth as possible. When was it founded? Who is the founder? What exactly is the category of the company? Who are the competitors? You yeah. know, what are people saying about them? Just having a unified source of truth about one company from 35 different sources and just having the closest truth, you know, coming out is the most nuanced AI problem here. And, oh, yeah. I and, mean, e- even and, just in a very simple example, Crunchbase, the, in- the data is input by the company themselves. Right. And so you don't know if that's last month's data or two years ago data. Absolutely. Uh, and you check around and you get totally different numbers and totally different kind of uh, even business models, uh, depending on what online source, what online directory of startup companies you're looking at. Absolutely. And that is the biggest problem. And we believe that we are best sort of suited to, because we've done this for years. It is not easy to unify all this data because it's, it's really going back to the old age old adage of, you know, garbage in garbage out. Because if you feed in data that doesn't make sense or is not correct, you're not going to get back a very useful answer and a response. So the, the way we use Gen AI within Rocketship is to make sure that, you know, we are using um, Gen AI tools to get closest to when the truth, mm-hmm. you know, hey, yeah, this- Get this, closer to the truth. Get closer to the truth. And the other ways is that the, you know, the category of a company, the more granular you get from the description or whatever is available online is really useful. Yes. Because that's when, you know, the observational data point that I was making, how do you make different companies compete with each other and, and figure out which one is the best in which category you need to have the granularity of the category. And yeah. so we are using it for, you know, things like that. So, so we are, you know, without giving away too much, there's, there's a lot of nuanced ways in which you can use Gen AI to construct something that's going to give you a meaningful outcome. 
rather than sort of trying to ask it something which is, you know, which is a simulation to the end result. Yeah. I guess trying to simulate the steps using Gen AI to get you to the outcome that is the best is what, you know, is how we are thinking of using Gen AI. Uh, and, you know, of course, um, there's going to be a lot of backward working as well, where people ask the ultimate, like, which is the best company right now, or, you know, give me X, Y, Z, and you can work backwards as well. But, you know, we want to kind of work stepwise. Forward. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious and sort of, do you input things like consideration because there's such a big concern about bias in training data and so forth? Uh, how do you handle issues or, or does the company care about diversity or about, you know, possible, you know, negative impact of companies and so forth? Yeah, I think as this is a very well-timed question because I think the Congress has just mandated that all VC funds have to report, uh, you know, things like diversity and whatnot. And I think the news just came out yesterday. Um, and I think that's a really good move, uh, you know, and it's... Um, uh, might not be welcomed by everybody, but it's certainly welcomed by us. Um, I think, um, you know, first of all, it's such a black box that until I do an outbound reach out, I don't know who is on the other side. Uh, okay. You know, there have that been makes, some, yeah. it, it, you know, we really just don't know until we reach out. And we've, we've been surprised by some of the people that we have spoken to uh, and surprised positively always mm -hmm. because, you know, we know we have a great amount of, uh, a great amount of sort of like confirmational bias in the companies that we speak to because our algorithms have kind of like predicted those yeah. companies to be the best. But, you know, I think, look, I'll, I'll go back to this and I've got this criticism and I'll be the first one to talk about this criticism openly. You know, it is the data that goes in that is going to finally, we cannot predict something out of the box. And the data is inherently biased to you know, certain kinds of, and it's not the data that we have accumulated. Startups have no, so historically years been, of yeah. years of biased data it can't be unbiased overnight. Overnight, you know, it's yeah. it is that more male founders have founded companies. It is that you know many of the startups for the first many and number of years have come out of the valley. It is Although that I have heard you know data points from people that women founded companies tend to have a higher exit value than. Absolutely. Well founded companies. So. Absolutely. And, uh, and I'll just tell you the clearest example of this bias being in the data, but yet being because the data takes us to where the action is happening. For example, we saw very, very early on companies outside of the valley in Colorado, in Texas, you know, in Washington, D.C. We saw that happen in 2017, 2016 itself. In fact, many of the companies that we've invested in outside the valley happened in 2015 and 16. So we saw that. There was no data that was pointing us because maximum amount of data was in the valley, but the data took us outside the valley. So that's the first thing to say that something is, you know, something is magical when you just want to predict on the Y variable, which is what is the measurement of the, you know, like how, what the quality of a company mm -hmm. is really independent of sometimes it's, it is constructed on the X variables, which is the data that's available but we have been able to go out of the valley quite a bit, and we've been able to do a lot of things. Well, it and 14 different countries, and that's really kind of my last big question is how this uh, enables a more international approach to venture capital investing. Do you think that the old kind of, I'm not going to invest in a company unless it's within two hours driving distance, has that completely, is that disappearing or you know, how, how does this play out on the international scale, especially because quality of data is really variable if you've got sources from other countries? Absolutely. I think that's the one thing we spent a lot of time on. We, um, we didn't invest in some economies because we weren't sure about the quality of the data uh -huh. um, um, for a while, for a long time. Uh, we have spent just an insane amount of time, uh, you know, um, looking at the data, observing the data, kind of uh, making sure that everything is looking correct. We have done a lot of anomaly detections in the publicly available sources. You can make up your ratings. You can make up numbers. You can, uh, you know, we are, and it's actually given us a lot of clarity on the last mile. If there is a company that's showing up that has got a huge growth story, we always want to make sure that it's not paid growth. 
you know, you can pay and do marketing, paid marketing. And we saw this uh, in certain geographies, in certain, you know, it's sectors. It's the equivalent of writing a book and hiring somebody to buy 10,000 copies of the book so that you become, you get onto the New York Times bestseller right. list. And then, of course, you sell millions of copies of your book. Yeah, exactly right. right. And so we are very wary of those kinds of things. So we've, you know, and it has actually, you know, I'd say that we've done a lot of work with the data on this end, but we've also done a lot of work with reaching out to companies in the last mile where we have started becoming smarter about asking some questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing that I'll just give you an anecdote, a lot of our founders, when we talk to them, Many of them ask us, you know, A, how did you know this about us already? B, you know, uh, like nobody else has asked me this question. And so we've kind of learned through the years, uh, you know, from our data, from what can go, you know, the anomalies of what's going on uh, to kind of, you know, ask these questions. And so it's just kind of made us uh, a little bit more aware, a little bit more sort of hyper aware, I should say. Uh, and, you know, and of course, it's, uh, it, it is very difficult to, set shop in Latin America because something's going on or set shop in like Indonesia because something is going on. So, so we've really, really been able to take advantage of, you know, uh, of our algorithms. But kind of turning this around, Madhu, you have a very international background. Yeah. Do you think that your approach to venture capital investing now, um, how did your international background influence the situation now? Does it, did it lead you to look at the data in a different way? How, how? Yeah. I think the one thing that I will say is that, um, you know, having experience in different countries while you evaluate startups has definitely helped me. You know, it's not something that I can kind of completely discard, yeah. uh, even if the data brought us. Or should you even discard? I mean, really? Absolutely. And so that's that's definitely been, um, you know, my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I think we live in such a... Um, I think the world is really a small place right now. We live in a very flat world. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of activity, startup act, especially in the startup ecosystem. Uh, it's it's flat uh, to a large well, extent because is, of the internet. This is kind of more on the startup side of the equation, but you know, if you're taking a more global approach to venture capital investing, then startup companies really have to consider kind of the borderless possibility more than they used to. I think. Absolutely right. There's a lot of companies starting in Southeast Asia and India and Africa that want to sort of expand here, especially if they're B2B SaaS because it's the biggest market. Um, there's a lot of US companies that want to go out. We have companies that are in data storage, um, uh, you know, doing really well, competing with Amazon and Google that want to sell in international markets in Europe, in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, uh, you know, and so it's a very flat world. Uh, and I've enjoyed being part of that flat world and the borderless world. And now I see it more and more per percolated, you know, among startups, among VCs. Uh, I don't think I've met many early stage funds that just want to do the US anymore. They want to be looking out for the best, the next be best and big thing from anywhere. So do you worry about this kind of flat world suddenly having a falling off place? I mean, are, are we going to move away from globalization? Is this going to be harder to do business like this in the future? And, you know, I think um, globalization really is here to stay. Uh, I, I, I find it very hard. Uh, you know, and we are also seeing it in the world order now. You know, it's, it's, a, we are, it's in a different world that we live now. Uh, the internet, the mobile revolution, they, they've all been very big parts of all of that. So, you know, we... I, I think that the globalization wave is here to stay. Uh, I think that, um, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think I'll, I'll probably just say yeah, that. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so we'd like to open up the floor to questions. If you're on the Zoom meeting and you have a question, please type it in the chat. That way I can read it out so everybody here in the auditorium will know what your question is. So, um, yeah, questions from the audience here. Down front. You found down front. <laughs> I saw you first. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, without uh, intruding into your secret sauce, what kinds of data do you look at uh, apart from financial metrics and data on the founders? Do you use some alternative data or other types of sources? Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, I, so we use a lot of uh, social data publicly available information, 
uh, you know, we're obviously on like uh, Twitter and just web crawls and all of that. So that's that's social. Uh, we also use uh, whatever is available on, you know, on Crunchbase, on Pitchbook and all of that. So that's that's also, you know, something that we are. So it's both publicly and privately available data. Um, we are looking at financial metrics of different sorts uh, and, um, you know, and, and some other data sources, uh, you know, on hiring and, and things like that. So, so there's, so there's a, uh, there's a variety around, uh, around employees and founders. Uh, there's a variety around the financial metrics of the company. And then there's a, there's a variety around sort of the socially available signals of the company, just to name a few. And then we use some other stuff. Yeah. So if somebody has a really good marketing officer in the startup company and can get them into the news all the time, yeah. Is that something that you're able to factor in? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, that's, I think, directionally, to be honest, there are not too many companies that do that. And if there's, uh, you know, if there are companies, I mean, there are companies that, well, there are not too many companies in the 1200 that we have that do that. Okay. And so we have a way of whittling that out, uh, okay. you know, and so, you know, we are, we are careful about such things and, and anomaly detections, if you, if you will. Um, but then there are times when in the last mile, we will see it. Yeah. Okay. But it's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So thanks for providing us those insights. So I'm also working as an associate at a small VC here in Bay Area. We are very much outbound VC and uh, we are using Gen AI a lot. And it is basically uh, removing the non-linear nature of the whole uh, uh, pipeline. And we are able to integrate our sources. However, we are not using Gen AI to basically um, take the decisions because we are still Yep. Not sure about it, like how much that would be different from the human perspective. So what is uh, your take about it? Like, would you use that the new Gen AI tools for taking decisions or not? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I just to be completely transparent, we are not using even AI to make the ultimate decisions because I think it's still very difficult in private markets to be able to make that ultimate decision because the last mile is always a company's internal metrics you know, just subjectivity in terms of the founding team, things like that. But removing all that till the last mile, can you use Gen AI? It's a little early to tell. We are using Gen AI to get us to get better at asking the question. So we are using Gen AI to improve the data quality even more by 10x. Actually, we've not really measured the impact but it's 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 really really like making the data much much better is what we have now observed and we're doing some back tests to sort of quantify that improvement could be a 5x could be a 10x but it really really synthesizes the data to be able to produce amazing outcomes and so that's what we are seeing the power of gen ai in really and i mean i think that we are still a little far away uh, and, and far away is a relative term. It could be 18 months, it could be 24, it could be three to five years that we could actually ask Gen AI, perhaps. Uh, but right now we are not there yet. And so I tend to agree with you. You can't use Gen AI to make the ultimate decisions. So I apologize for this next question from uh, our online chat because it kind of has to do with that joke I said about uh, you know X formerly known as Twitter. Uh, the first, uh, Ola writes, Someone told me that the more Twitter data is used to train AI systems, the worse the outcome. <laughs> I don't know if it was being funny, but as I, he I heard you were using Twitter, and that was my fault. I don't know if you do or not. Um, do you apply guardrails or other measures to make sure you get the best and not the worst? Yeah. Well, I think that's a really good question. Um, we do use social signals. Okay. We use ratings. We use... Uh, app data. Uh, we use proxies. So people who will rate like a software program, the developers who will say this gets a five out of five versus a four out of five. Or you know, and so the Twitter mention is very similar to maybe an app any date. Like you download an app and you give it a rating. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are measuring that kind of information, uh -huh. uh, and it's a and, and it is a, a measurement that goes in. Do we apply guardrails? That's exactly what I was saying. We spend. We have spent years in making sure that we have a great amount of anomaly detection. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, 
also don't like uh, the signal of you know an overwhelming amount of just talk like your chief marketing officer yeah. you know uh, you know doing just there's a lot of that, things and there's also the point that usually people who have strong enough feelings to write a comment That's right. are not necessarily representative of the sort of expected normal distribution exactly. absolutely of, you know yeah absolutely and so we've so we've got we have put a lot of guardrails in place um the reality is that a lot of that in the initial years to this uh, you know to this person's point it did pass through you know our filters and it kind of uh, you know we, it was in perhaps in the you know 10 out of the 1200 so it did make it to the 1200 mm -hmm. if i'm using that as a superset yeah over the years we have gotten better and today you know we're happy to sort of report that maybe one out of 1200 gets into that bucket so we uh, so what happens is the weightage of certain things gets suppressed twitter yeah. might be one of them you know as you get more and more data and your algorithms get better and better less weight less weight it suppresses yeah. the weight and so very good point but you know that's why like i keep saying the assembly of the data is a very complex and nuanced ai problem and it helps that all of us are data scientists we are all computer all scientists okay most of us are and um you know and we and we know especially who are building the algorithms mm -hmm. and we are also investors so so we've been able to weed out a lot of that noise yeah okay thank you justin go ahead well thanks again for the talk um i'm a stanford undergraduate and a lot of my friends are interested in working in bc in the future uh, a lot of them also will major in more qualitative things like psychology um thinking that in vc that there's very much a focus on understanding the founders and their mentalities and that is what's going to allow them to have an edge over the competition but you're saying that data is really the future of uh, venture capital so with that in mind what would you tell a stanford undergraduate who wants to get into vc uh, about what they should do right now to be ready for it well, i i think that's a great question you know um something that is um really important to note is that um this data is not data is a tool data is just a tool and at the end of the day uh you know the people that were that built even a stitch fix you know they were not you know all sort of computer scientists that are building something to sell you know you it's it's a tool and in fact in our uh, in our own fund Uh, we have some you know spectacular investors who are not from a data background at all um you know who've gone to more traditional who have done ma more traditional sort of majors uh, psychology um it, it just is a gamut it it really is about uh, you know it really is about using the tool in an effective way and being able to still make that last mile decision so you know i think uh, to keep the answer a very long answer very short uh, this is a tool that is available to everybody to any reasonable person who is going to be able to make it it's like using excel you know it's a, you 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 do it to kind of make your outcomes better and make it faster so it's available to everybody and it should be available to everybody and it should become more and more like a like an out of the box solution you just you just have these companies you know the reasons why they're showing up and you're able to act on them if it makes sense if i can add just a bit to that really data science is about combining this knowledge of how to analyze data with domain knowledge actually right you know so psychology is very good you know field to know about in terms of understanding markets and so forth totally might be one of those ways you notice anomalies quickly absolutely <laughs> i think especially in the last mile due diligence absolutely yeah then Hi. Um, so my name is uh, I'm an advisee of Professor Dasher, and uh, I'm currently a second year master student. So I think uh, on the website of Rockish, we see that you guys have invested in fees as well. Fees, F I Z Z. Yes, fees. Absolutely. Like yep. Yep. And it's also said that it's, despite it's very like data driven venture capital firm, it's still investing in seed stage. So I wonder what is the decision making process specifically behind the fees? as example to demonstrate that how would you leverage the data to to make a decision on the seed stage investment or social app stuff like that and the reason why i'm asking this question is that i joined a startup uh, this summer i should have updated with my advisor first but uh sorry <laughs> this summer we, we are having a public revelation and, uh, here we have yeah. raised the 1 1 million us dollars and they have yeah. started 
will migrate to the United States soon to get onboarded our first primary users. And um, Tencent and uh, Tsinghua University are our um, paid customers right now in China. But I can update with you that later. But yeah. so I'm wondering, like, what's the decision making process for fees specifically? And how would you leverage data to make investment special in the C stage? Thank you. Absolutely. I think um, that that's an interesting question. Um, so uh, in early seed stage companies, so Fizz was not found by us through any social signals, just to be completely transparent. Um, we do measure, some algorithms measure founder quality. Uh, and um, and we also, so, and again, I think I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think FISC was an inbound to us. It's one of the, so 95% of our companies are outbound and some of them are inbound. Seed stage, we have done investing and we do investing based on certain other qualities like uh, certain other functions like founder quality and things like that. So this is one of the companies that came out of founder quality uh, screens. It, it would be like a company that came out of founder quality screens. Yeah, so I think, um, and then question when, for everybody was what kind of founder qualities attract you as an investor? Yeah. I, I think, look, it's just, it's, uh, uh, you know, everybody would agree that a certain amount of passion and determination, uh, you know, and I would say this, I've seen this through my career and it's completely subjective. You can have different problems and different, in, like right now, Gen AI is a great, you know, everybody wants to start a company in Gen AI. What I've seen is that no matter what kind of company, uh, you know, what kind of a startup environment it is, there are certain founders that will be determined enough to solve certain problems. So they can go and like found two or three companies and they will still be successful no matter what the environment is. So it's the passion, it, it's a determination. It's really just those two things of a founder that I think trumps everything else. Um, and, you know, of course, how does the algorithm measure it? I have to ask, you know, my, the, there are lots of different ways of measuring that. It's, it's your entire career graph. You know, where have you been? You know, what is the what is a proxy to determination and passion? You know, have you been sort of following this trend for a while? Have you interned somewhere? Have you, you know, do you belong to a certain sort of school that does this better than others? Things like that. So these are all proxies to passion and determination. And of course, in the end, we do have to speak to the company and to the founders. For Fizz, I believe we found the traction and the founders to be outstanding at that time. So that's why we invested in it. Yeah. So a question from Zoom, Diana asked about using Gen AI in your decision-making or in your sourcing and so forth. Um, are you doing that now? And um, if you are, are you already seeing a difference in the outcomes of the portfolio value? Yeah. I, th I believe I answered this question in the sense that we are using it in our data. Okay. And we don't have an exact, uh, and we are not doing it for the ultimate decision. And I believe it was a previous question as well. We are using it to make our input data better. But is it perceivably better now that you have it? And so we're doing some data back testing okay. and it is perceivably better. I don't know. I can't sort of say 2x or 5x or 10. I can't quantify it, but it is perceiv perceivably better. Yeah. So using Gen AI has been perceivably better for us. Okay. I think there's a question back here. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks for the discussion. Uh, a quick question. Are there any companies that completely surprised you from your data based on your intuition? So, for example, you say, this should not be there, but somehow my data indicates that yep. this company is there. And what did surprise you? Like, you know, what is, if you can name the company or something like that, and what surprised you about it? Absolutely. I think there have been, that is the beauty of this kind of investing. There have been so many surprises. Uh, I, I cannot even like um, uh, tell you, but I'll just tell you a trend. Um, we started seeing India in 2015. It's not even a company, it's a country. It surprised us. We just happened to be, you know, uh, Indian origin. You know, I, 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 I have not worked in India at all. And so I was surprised in 20... Like, Let me jump in here because there was really less than a billion dollars going into Indian venture capital 12 or 13 years ago. This has been something that has risen just amazingly in the last few years. I mean, just in a few so years. So back, you know, really 2015. 2015. India? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So when we found India to be hopping in our screens, we just thought, you know, what the hell? Like, this is something wrong. And so we, one of the partners actually called 
a few venture capital funds in India and said, hey, we are seeing all of this activity, what's going on? And they're like, no, no, there's nothing really. We found out later that a lot of Chinese apps were active in India at the time. So there was something going on. And then later when we back tested, Reliance Geo had just launched the, you know, uh, that entire free data plan and the entire country had data, you know, in, on its hands. And we discovered that in our algorithms all of a sudden. Now, what is really funny is that fast forward to 2022, India dropped from our, uh, you know, on our screens like a hot potato. We were seeing in, uh, you know, 60%, 50% of the companies from 2017 to 2022 to be India. For example, if I have 100 companies in my pipeline a month, 60 of them were in India at one point, 50, 40, whatever. It was a, it was a, it was a high number. In 2022, we had less than 10. In 2023, it's about 10, 15. So it's not just a company, but we've seen an entire country sort of like go up and then go down. Uh, and it still holds, you know, some great companies as well. I mean, I'm not kind of trying to, uh, you know, throw India, throw the baby out with the, you know, with the bathwater. You know, I think um, what happens is that India was hopping. We were there in the right time. We invested in the right time. We were early. Yeah. We were early and we kind of made, you know, great investments. We've come out and um, I think that India has suffered with the, you know, there's not that many quality companies coming out of India right now. For whatever reason, we have to wait. It's still, you know, I'm just telling you guys as I see it in my algorithms right now. Um, I'm also guessing indirectly that there's a lot more venture capital. And so what you're measuring is really opportunity for your firm. And so if there's a lot more venture capital chasing companies that are not a whole lot better, then, you know, yeah. the ratio is not as good. Actually, that's not true because okay. uh, sometimes, okay. you know, the amount of, uh, we, are, we don't get bothered in our investment about which other fund is in, interested. Okay. Um, it is a measure of success for a startup to be chased by all those dollars. Yeah. So we still want to get into the best and it doesn't matter if, you know, 15 others are chasing you. There's sharp elbows. We'll deal with it. We have a lot of value add to give the companies. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that, anyway, uh, India was one. We've seen a lot of others, you know, and in terms of companies to answer your question specifically, uh, you know, we've seen sort of uh, companies in space, which, you know, nobody else had seen before. And we saw them earlier than anybody else had. Uh, we were surprised by the trend ourselves. Uh, you know, we've seen companies in um, uh, in blockchain and crypto very, very many years ago. Uh, we were, you know, uh, we we saw, um, uh, uh, you know, we saw Musically, uh, uh, you know, which became the TikTok. Musically. Yeah, which became TikTok. We saw it before anybody else saw it. So we've, you know, we've we've seen a lot of things which have interested us a lot, and we are constantly surprised because. Later on, they became, you know, pretty big uh, and we are, const we are early, which is great news, which is what the algorithm is supposed to be doing. So lots of surprises. Thank you. Another question from Zoom from Sandra uh, about your own cybersecurity and whether you're using artificial intelligence for your own cybersecurity and maybe more general comment about AI and cybersecurity. Yeah. I think, um, you know, cybersecurity as an entire uh, sector, we are really interested in. I'm really interested in, uh, you know, and lots of great companies that we keep seeing. Uh, but for our own, you know, we, we are all um, computer scientists as well. Uh, and so, you know, we are, we are very, very um, wary about making sure that our systems are safe and secure because we have a lot of company data that we take very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, you know, some of the times the way we do this is we don't even have internal company metrics anywhere, yeah. uh, you know, in our algorithms and, you know, and sometimes we mm -hmm. keep it sort of separate. Uh, but we have, uh, you know, we've invested a lot of money in security for our, our own data. I can imagine. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the floor? Go ahead. Hey, um, thank you so much for your uh, sharing of, of your work. Um, I am sure you might have seen the pitch book report uh, last year that shows that um, most of, like actually only 2% of VCs uh, dollars goes to female founder. Um, I'm wondering like how, what if you can share the portfolio of female owned companies that Rocketship are currently investing in 
and also on your insights of what needs to happen, like yeah. it, whether it's incentive or metrics that need to integrate into the data to, to change that statistic? Absolutely. I think that's a really valid question. And uh, there are not too many, too many female VCs too, to be, uh, you know, uh, to be honest here. Um, I think uh, the one way that rocket ship definitely has made a difference is that, like I said, we are not, we don't even know who we are speaking to when we reach out to the people, you know, it's, so it's a, it's a black box. Uh, we have spoken to uh, a lot of uh, female founders just in the last month, you know, my colleague Zubin has spoken to many, many who's here in the audience and you can, you know, re reach out to him later, a couple of people here from rocket ship today. Um, we have spoken to a lot of folks, um, uh, you know, across the board uh, and we are, and so we try to do our best that this black box of a solution really kind of makes it, uh, you know, makes it as flat as possible uh, and, you know, as not biased as possible. But of course, like I said, and acknowledge it really like we are trying to build an algorithm on top of historical data and, and, and not just historical data. It's historical data and data that is getting every day, like any company that gets incorporated anywhere around the world comes into our system. So it is a function of what's going on in the world. And if there are not too many women starting, uh, you know, companies, then that's going to be represented, unfortunately, in our data. And that is the truth uh, anyway. Um, so kind of outside your own fun, do you have things that you would like to see to yeah, get more? Yeah. Um, and I was just going to come to more that. More BC to women. Absolutely. Okay. I was just going to come to that. So in our fund, we've tried to attack it with trying to be, you know, technologically sort of unbiased uh, as much as possible because it is representative of what's going on which is what enters the data. Outside of that, I believe that it has to flow from, you know, upstream where we have limited partners. VCs have limited partners. Limited partners are pension funds and institutions and others. Uh, that the mandate really needs to start at that, at that place where folks are giving much more money to certain kinds of things like women-led startups or you know, diversity or whatever it is. And um, that's happening more and more. Uh, they're calling it impact investing and whatnot. It's getting a little bit better. It's not there where it should be. Uh, you know, the money, you know, you put your, your money where your mouth is. That's, that's the adage. And I think that it's not happening as quickly as it should. Um, I, I believe that the, there's a lot of voices now. Uh, there's a lot of noise as well. And uh, the more we can create that, it's just going to be much better. Um, and uh, I think, I think the one thing that I will say is that one concrete way, you know, from the LPs and the money and the capital available, there should be many more board members uh, mandated in the startup world as well. Uh, women sitting on uh, boards. I believe the boards that I sit on, there is as sometimes being the only uh, woman, you know, female voice. It makes a difference. It's uh, you know, it's it breaks the routine. Uh, it's a different perspective sometimes. It's just important. These little changes, but it's already started happening. There's a lot more mandates to do all of that. And, you know, uh, yeah. Thanks. We have kind of almost a follow up question on uh, Zoom. Uh, in is the U.S. VC landscape going to shift toward the global South over the coming decades? If so, to what scale and are the data and models built to consider those changes over time? Uh, you know, what, uh, are, do you have the models to deal with emerging markets? Yeah, I mean, emerging markets, our models are very, very um, just unbiased. We just kind mm -hmm. of, you know, it's, it's universal. It takes us to different sectors, to different countries. So we are never going to build anything specifically for emerging markets or okay. the valley or anything. Okay. Per se. You know, I think the valley and of course, you know, uh, we are, we um, we pride ourselves for being headquartered here. I don't think the valley is ever going to go uh, away. Uh, Gen AI, when that happened, I don't think the valley will go away. But think about it: thirty-three percent of the venture capital investments in the United States are made here in Silicon Valley. But what percentage of those are really going to other countries? You know, what percentage of those are going to? Uh, you know, rapidly growing markets in Southeast Asia or in South Asia. Yeah, I think it's I think it's beginning to happen in sectors that make sense. Okay. You know, there are some sectors that are going to be traditionally in the valley. Uh, there are certain things that happen here better than anywhere else. You know, mm -hmm. quantum computing is one. Gen AI is another one. 
uh, you know, it's it is better than you know. I, I can't speak about China, uh, but I can definitely say that you know, uh, everywhere else, you know, India is not close uh, in terms yeah. of Jenny. I, neither is Southeast Asia or LATAM or you know Africa or even Europe. Europe is not close. The research uh, is there in Japan, but it's still yeah. research. Yeah. Japan is an extremely interesting, uh, yeah. you know, place as well. But Europe and Japan, it's just, you know, it's not going to, it's, that's not a sector that's going to be, you know, getting the commensurate amount of uh, dollars as the valley will get. But then there are other sectors like fintech, you know, some building something in insurance and, you know, that, that maybe Europe, maybe, you know, uh, building insurance for Europe, you know, building insurance for Southeast Asia. Those are different kinds of models. And then there is, you know, a lot to go around. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are some things that are just not going to go out of the U.S. Um, uh, is my belief. And, you know, it'll be, uh, it, there will be a lot of catching up in other economies, but it's a catch up and it's not right now. Yeah. And then there'll be something else that the U.S. will do better than everybody else. What about cooperation among VCs? Is it hard for you to cooperate with the old traditional VCs or do you work together well <laughs> yeah i mean we all work together as well as i can say we do but okay. you know if you want to get into a company that's doing really well and go all the way there is you know there's a lot of co healthy competition i would say yeah. you know folks want to get into the best companies and sure. uh, and they, as they, they should be there there's always space for a lot of collaborative work uh, which you know rocket ship we are we are great collaborators i'm just going to put it out there but you know the vc uh, world is like any other world you know Everybody wants to be in the best company. And sometimes there's just not enough space for $50 million in a $15 million round. Yeah. So, you know, that's where it all lands. Yeah. But I can also imagine that your sort of different approach would be very interesting to a company that has, to a VC that's looking at a startup from a very different sort of more traditional. And approach. I think that's such a valid point. There are lots of VCs. Uh, you know, that support us. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Mark Andreessen is an investor in our fund, publicly available information. Okay. Uh, he's a big supporter and he's always been. Um, and so we've, we've had a lot of support and they appreciate our thought. They appreciate our perspective. They appreciate our newness of ideas. And so we are, you know, uh, we've got a lot of support. Yeah. Okay. So we're already out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming today and Madhu, thanks for a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.